so here we are in the middle of Lent. Our intentional spiritual wilderness journey, and it's a season that we are called to regularly pause to evaluate our lives. Two weeks ago, during the Desert Southwest Conference clergy gathering in Tucson, our new bishop, Carlo Rappanut, reminded us that the root word of evaluation, because sometimes when you hear the word evaluation, you kind of like shudder, those of us who have regularly get evaluated. He reminded us that the root word of evaluation is value. So my question for you is that as you've been on this journey, as you are walking this journey, what are you finding valuable in your life? What is valuable in your life? Where are you seeing God at work? Where are you experiencing God's grace alive and bubbling up? Remember those bubbles that we had at, during Advent? Where do you see God working in you? However, perhaps some of us are feeling a bit dry, spiritually parched, desiring for the divine healer to quench our spiritual thirst. Our gospel story today is, for me, one of the most moving gospels in our scriptures, in our Bible, one that has become more meaningful, that became more meaningful during my renewal leave last year. And I'm hoping that you will find it as well a, an eternal refreshment for your soul. As United Methodist, we believe that God initiates love. God initiates grace and then we respond. We all feel empty and overwhelmed at times, and perhaps you today can, are feeling burdened, overworked, or perhaps you feel like an outsider, a foreigner. You feel that you're not wholly accepted by others. I think this story has the potential to meet you where you are and enable you to open your heart to receive more of God's grace. The story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well speaks to our yearnings, these yearnings of feeling like an outsider, or yearnings that we feel, oh, we need to stop working so much, or oh, we're just not accepted. The Samaritan woman is a marginalized woman on many levels, and Jesus, as the text implies, is also tired, not only from his journey by foot to Galilee, but the continued conflicts he's been experiencing from the Pharisees. He and his disciples take a break from their journey, stopping at an ancient well, Jacob's well. A woman comes to draw water, and Jesus asks her for a drink. As I prepared for today's sermon, I noticed for the first time the reason that Jesus was traveling. As a young girl, preachers focused only on the Samaritan woman and her sordid lifestyle and how she was the one in need. And in this reading, I see that Jesus is also in need of assistance not only is he physically tired from his journey, he must be emotionally tired from the constant harassment from the Pharisees. Someone comes to the well carrying buckets, and so he asks her for a drink. Jesus, at that moment, steps into the role of receiver as he asks the woman to be the giver. As they interact, Jesus tells her how she can receive the gift of a spiritual well of life-giving waters. Verse 14 says, Whoever drinks from the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in those, that's all you, in those who drink it a spring of water that bubbles up 
into eternal life. This courageous woman becomes not only the receiver of an eternal life-giving spring of water, but also the source and the giver of the gift of living water. Last year at this time, I was pretty exhausted, yet hopeful because the SPRC folks in the church council had approved my request for renewal leave. Many of you stepped up to participate in the worship services while I was away, and some of you were able to preach for the very first time. I felt your support during those weeks. On Easter Monday, I boarded a plane for a Catholic retreat house in San Diego, and their sister Bunny met me when I arrived and informed me that I would be meeting with her daily. I wasn't ready for me to be told what I was going to be doing, but I, was welcome, I welcomed this invitation because it had been a couple of years since I had met with a spiritual director. During our first session, one that was a bit more of a getting to know you and why are you here interaction, I shared my journey with Bunny. Bunny provided a listening presence as I spoke. And then halfway through our time together, she quietly sighed. And then she reached down for her Bible and read from John 7. Out of the believer's heart will flow rivers of living water. Out of the believer's heart will flow rivers of living water. Well, she then looked at me and I assured her that whatever rivers I had were about dried up. And then she turned the couple of pages back to the story of Jesus and the woman at the well and read from her NRSV. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. Well, I thought to myself, so I guess the water is still there somewhere because she just said eternal, and that's a very long time. In her gentle way, Benny, uh, Bunny asked me, where this spring of water resided in me. And the tears started to flow down my face, which was a good thing, because it had been a long time since I had cried. Bunny waited silently for my answer. And I took a bit of time to answer this one, because I felt like I was sitting in front of the board of ordained ministry answering theological questions. I felt like I was in the corner. Bunny was gentle, but she was also a bit of a fierce force. And so I waited to thinking, what is the right answer for this? What is she wanting me to say? I wanted to prove to her that I, a person who has her master's of divinity and then some, knew this answer. But growing up in the fundamental evangelical home, I was taught that Jesus, I had to ask Jesus into my heart. And Bunny is Catholic, and so I wasn't sure what the right answer was for her. And so after a while, I just squeaked out, in my heart? Over the next several days with Bunny's encouragement, I returned to my heart. I returned to the source of this wellspring of bubbling water. And I sat with Nan Merrill's translation of, John, of, of, sorry, of Psalm 74. I'd really encourage you to Google that sometime and look that up. Nan Merrill's translation of Psalm 74. And I made the psalmist's words my own. O oh, beloved of my heart, what does it mean that I feel separated from you? Doubt and anxiety have crept into the inner tabernacle, erecting walls as a defense. And as I sat with this psalm, I realized that I, who was pretty much living from my heart center, 
Some might say I lived with the, my heart on my sleeve. I had walled off my heart. I had become too busy and I had strayed from my heart, from the wellspring of living water. And as Nan Merrill puts it, all the beauty and joy of companioning with the divine, the holy source of all being, was becoming just a memory. And yet, like the Samaritan woman, I was yearning that my heart would be refreshed once more, freely bubbling again. You know, each of us is different in how we respond to the busyness of life, the busyness of our lives. I've even heard those who are retired say, I've been, I'm more busy than I ever was before. Each of us, whether we are pastors, counselors in the medical field, engineers, students, teachers, Uber drivers, managers of a company, retired grandparents, great-grandparents, each of our circumstances, particularly after COVID, or we're still in this COVID season, carries a new measure of stress and strain that makes it easy for us to pull away from our heart center of intelligence. This busyness or the stresses that life can bring make it easy for us to move away from the wellspring of bubbling, life-giving waters. Easy for us to wall off our heart and operate from our head center, our minds, relying on the knowledge we have or our past experience. Perhaps we still have the gifts, but we are lacking compassion. However, without being fully integrated into what we believe, loving God, neighbor, and self with the wholeness of body, mind, and heart, life will become dry and very difficult. For some reason... Lent, the season of Lent, can trigger our past and our not-so-past losses and traumas. The scriptures and the liturgy lend themselves to reflecting on loss. But even in the midst of Lent, we can find refreshment. We don't have to wait until Easter Sunday to experience God's grace to experience alleluias. Spiritual teacher and activist Barbara Holmes writes, in the midst of devastating crises, we are asked to do the counterintuitive. When the time calls for anxiety, flight, or fight, and I will add freeze, we are asked to allow for the possibility of contemplative refuge, respite, and renewal. To slow down and be still. And when we do this, it allows both the source of our troubles and options for recovery to emerge. To slow down and to hear that God is with us. For many, stillness begins with a time of meditation, perhaps a 20 minutes of centering prayer, and yet silence, sitting for 20 minutes, isn't for everyone. Many times, getting into our bodies, like hiking or yoga or weightlifting or a round of golf, can release us to move back into a centered balance of mind, body, and heart. And for some, being creative, painting, knitting, sewing can help. I am learning that silence isn't necessary for stillness or mindfulness. John Zinn suggests that mindfulness is about love and loving life. When you cultivate this love, it gives you clarity and compassion for life. And your actions happen in accordance with that. God is indeed love. And like a loving parent, 
God lovingly welcomes us every time that we must return. Returning back to God is a joy for God. My prayer for us during this season is that we will return to our heart. Return to the life-giving waters that God, the source of all love, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit supply. And then, and then, my friends, we will become, become able to be givers, givers of this living water. Amen.